Hi everyone, here's Daniela from the Global Economic Dynamics team. We just wrote a book abstract about the future of capitalism, a book written by Paul Collier, professor of public policy and economics at the University of Oxford. We got the chance to spontaneously interview him at the Global Solutions Summit in Berlin. We asked him a couple of questions about his book. We talked about his suggestions of making capitalism more ethical, also about a European identity, about climate, and about the role of companies in the society. So we hope you enjoyed the interview. And if you want to know more about our work, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also to check out the, the link to our blog that you can find down below. So have fun. What is, what is the main message of your book? So the book's in English. It's called The Future of Capitalism. <laughs> Uh, facing the new anxieties, right? In German, it's really a, a manifesto on social democracy, and that's a perfectly sensible translation of the ideas. Um, it's the it's the concern that in Germany, France, Britain, America, many of the developed economies, um, we've suffered two rifts that have emerged over the last 40 years. Um, one between the provincial parts of the country and the big metropolises. The big metropolises have been booming and the provincial cities have periodically been broken in the process of globalization. And the other rift, so that's a spatial rift, and the other is a, a new class rift between the well-educated been to a good university, on the back of that they get skills and they go, they sit on an escalator going upwards and then the people with less education who acquired manual skills, vocational skills, they find themselves on a down escalator. And of course these two processes are often coincident because the best educated people go to the metropolis and so you've got a, a skilled population in the, in the metropolis that thinks life is wonderful and a provincial less skilled population that knows life is far from wonderful and what's made that divide much worse and it's kept happening it's kept getting wider for the last 40 years why it's kept getting wider politically is that the metropolitan elite have peeled off from shared identity with others, with other citizens, and a sense of shared obligation with other citizens. And so they've diverted into a sort of rather smug, um, self-congratulatory, and very individu individualistic mode of life. Um, and that's a very unhealthy society. We need to get back to a sense of shared identity around which we build shared obligations, mutual regard and mutual obligations to each other. Uh, and as we do that, we will heal these rifts. We need to be able to bring productive jobs and dignity to people where they belong, not expect everybody to move to the metropolis or suffer in indignity. So spread the, the gains of capitalism across across the country and across the nations. Um, so the idea is also to make capitalism more, more ethical, yes, in a way. Um, you propose... In a way, very, very much so. Very much, exactly. And you propose um, a couple of things in your book in, in, in order to, to make capitalism more ethical. But could you give us three concrete examples, or the first step, the first measure that we could apply to make capitalism more ethical? Yes. So human beings are naturally rather ethical. We are not economic man, the grim depiction that my own subject of economics paints, where we're greedy and selfish. Right? There are a few people like that. They're sort of 3% of the population yeah. psychopathic. But the vast majority of us um, recognize our responsibilities to our responsibilities to others. We are morally load-bearing, right? And not only as we are, as individuals, naturally morally load-bearing, but so are the organizations we build. We build organizations that are bigger than ourselves to achieve purposes that are bigger than just ourselves. So the most obvious organization we all build is a family. 
And so families are naturally morally load-bearing, and they're the only organisation we've ever discovered which is capable of rearing children. Now, rearing children is very hard, especially if you're a young couple stressed, one person's lost a job or something, and so they need a lot of help. What they don't need is a lot of bullying from the top. So the same is true of the other big organisation we build, which is the firm. And so firms are naturally morally load-bearing. And we got this ghastly ideology from America, which said um, the firm, the only purpose of the firm is to make profits huh? for its shareholders. In other words, the firm is not, has no moral purpose whatsoever. Well, that's a travesty of what firms have always been. But from about 1960, Friedman, Milton Friedman, um, wrote a famous letter to the New York Times in 1970 saying it's only profit, it's the only motivation. That then gradually worked through the business schools. And by the 1990s, a lot of firms, including, for example, Deutsche Bank, which was an ethical disgrace, um, were being run by people who actually believed the sole purpose of the firm was to make money, supposedly for the shareholders, but most especially for themselves. Right? So the first thing that government can do is, is stop this ludicrous depic depiction of humanity as we're all greedy and selfish, except for some saints at the top who will be the platonic guardians of society, and they'll boss us all around. Right? That's the command and control society we've somehow stumbled into, where workers are subject to much more detailed contracts, they're subject to monitored performance tied to financial incentives, and so the space for genuine judgment trust and discretion has shriveled huh? in the workplace. We can see that from surveys. Okay, but how exactly, how do, how exactly do we achieve that? What are, what, what is the how do we reverse it? How yeah, do we exactly. reverse it? Okay, so first of all, the state stops this top-down, what I call paternalism, but it's really authoritarianism. Regulation of companies, but otherwise let them rip, and um, bullying of families. Right? So instead, what I propose is what I call social maternalism. And social maternalism looks at the chain of developing a child from birth until in about their mid-twenties they are both equipped in terms of skill to be a productive citizen that contributes and morally equipped to want to be a productive citizen that contributes. That chain from birth through to being a productive young citizen involves a, the family, it involves the firm, and it involves local government, schools, and such like. So that it's, it's decentralizing moral responsibility and the authority that goes with it to, to completing that chain, all the way along the chain. Okay. Right? So your suggestion is that the states accompany accompany this, the families or the, from, from the beginning until... Yes, the, 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 we can't do it all from the central state. This, the role of the central state is to enable other actors. Civil society. Germany's got quite a strong civil society, usually organized at the local level. It's got good local government. You want lo we want civil society locally to work with local government, to work with local firms, so that we got a, a very effective process, and, and with local schools, so that there's a sort of, sort of seamless passage from childhood to youth, uh, right through to, uh, to being a productive young adult. Um, that Germany does better than most, and so partly in the book I'm saying we can all learn from Germany. Right? Um, uh, but even Germany needs to do better, right? That's why you've got the, the mutiny of the poorer provinces. And if we look at Europe as a whole, unfortunately, in the last 20 years, 
the European Union has really produced a lot of divergence in which successful regions have done well and unsuccessful regions have fallen behind. And if the European Union means anything, it should mean a gradual process of convergence, the poorer places catching up with the richer places. And so we need to do, we need a commitment like Draghi's, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to, make, whatever it, it takes, we'll do to it. make it better. Yeah. And now that you talked about Europe, let's talk about uh, this idea of shared identity. You talk about that this is an important step in order to, to enable this reciprocity between humans. Now, talking about Europe, how do you create a shared identity for Europe when the continent is so diverse and they try to unify it since the beginning, since the, yeah. its foundation? Yeah. How do you achieve that here? So, obviously, it's very difficult. So the answer is um, face reality, right? Um, the, the best we've managed to do, the biggest shared identities we've managed to make really work are at the level of the nation, typically, right? Um, The societies where I work on, most of the time, which is Africa, they've not even managed to create a sense of shared identity at the level of the nation. The level of, ident of shared identity is very much smaller scale. They're extremely right? diverse. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, and they don't work. Right? Political power is up at the center, but identity is down at the level of the ethnic group. And whichever ethnic group gets hold of the center, it uses that power to help its own group. Yeah. So that's a catastrophe. Um, and you know, indeed, Europe is in danger of turning itself into Africa. If you shift all the power up to Brussels but don't create a sense of shared identity, then whoever controls Brussels will, you know, will use that in their own interest. So, um, the, so I think the best structure of Europe we can hope for is one in which most political power is, is at the level of the nation, but then nations come together for mutual gain. And so that, that's the advantage of having a sort of veto system, which for most of the time Europe has had, where we say, we'll do things where everybody gains, but let's try and do things that where the poorer benefit more than the richer. Okay? And for the last 20 years, we really haven't had that. You know, we've had very rapid divergence with uh, Greece crashing, Italy crashing, yeah. Spain crashing, mass unemployment, um, and Northern Europe doing very, very well. So you know. there is this divergence? Yes, there. yes. So, yeah. um, of course, when you get divergence like that, you get mutinies. Britain, the mutiny wasn't Britain versus Europe. Yeah. Right? The mutiny was the provinces versus London. Every region of England except London voted for Brexit. Right? It's obviously nothing to do with Brussels and Europe. But in Britain, you've had this acute divergence, a bigger and faster spatial divergence than anywhere else in Europe between provincial Britain and the, me the metropolis. And the metropolis, Britain's only got one metropolis, it's called London. Right? Um, and so You know, that was the mutiny in Britain. It produced Brexit, which was nothing to do with... With Europe the, itself. With, yeah, with, the, with the, cause, the, the cause of Brexit wasn't Europe, right? Um, and then we got in America the mutiny, which is Trump. And in France, we got the mutiny, which is the Gilets Jaunes. Um, in Germany, we got the mutiny, which is AFD. So th these mutinies are, are... I mean, none of them are really against Brussels. They're against their sort of national government. Of course, Brussels is, has very little power, financial power. I mean, um, despite all the fuss about Brussels, it only controls a little over 1% of GDP, um, whereas about 40% of GDP is going through our national governments. So the bit that's absolutely got to work is the national government, and it's the failings of the national government translate into, into these the yes, European exactly, identity. Exactly. I have another question that is also very important for the future of capitalism and its environment. We've, we've seen last Friday children all around the world going to the street trying to ask for a change in policy making to, to save the future of our planet. And there is a topic, in my opinion, that is a little bit lacking in the book. What is this 
does your idea of the future of capitalism includes a dimension of, of environment? Well, and how does it look like? That's partly because uh, a couple of books ago, uh, I, I did, a, did a book called The Plunder Planet, yeah, exactly. which was basically about how to reconcile the environment with, the with, 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 the, with, the, with an economy, you know. And so um, I feel I've been there and done that in this book. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's part, it's no, no, undoubtedly. So let me answer, uh, there's a good answer to your question, which is that, of course, um, with shared moral responsibility, once you distribute moral responsibility around the society, households and firms, then of course the future of the planet becomes one of the fundamental purposes of what are you about, you know. And so that translates into very practical things that households can do and that firms can do. Um, firms are now starting to recognize that and it's not just a sort of top-down regulation thing. The top-down regulation thing has been actually very poor <laughs> especially in Germany. I mean, the most anti-environmental decision that has been taken in Europe was your Chancellor's decision to close, close the nuclear industry and therefore expand the coal industry. And that inflicted very real risks on a billion Africans who are suffering climate change now to pander to a fantasy risk. Germany is in no risk of a tsunami and yet the decision was taken the week after the Japanese tsunami, right? Um, and to the extent that you have any nuclear risks, it's from the power stations of your neighbors that build them around you, not from your own nuclear power station. So this was a piece of disgraceful top-down misbehavior. Germany is the dirtiest carbon emitter per person in the whole of Europe, right? So that's a really appalling legacy from Germany, right? Um, so, what can firms do and households do? Well, firms are starting to want to do things. And actually, the reason is, the point you started with, that young people mm. are concerned about this. And so, firms are realizing that unless they incorporate a purpose larger than their own profits, they won't be able to recruit decent young people. In fact, the only sort of young people they'll be able to recruit uh, the, psychopathic, the psychopathic 3% and the psychopathic 3% um, don't want to make money for the firm, they want to make money for themselves and the easiest way of doing that is find a way of ripping the firm off. So they're the very people they don't want in the firm. You know? Thank you so much for that answer. And my very first, uh, last question would be, um, more, more, most of your analysis, your, your assumptions and conclusions are based on the same history that Europe and the United States share after the Second World War. Um, and I was wondering, does your idea of the future of capitalism apply for other countries that not necessarily share the same, the same history as the European and the United States? Did capitalism also fail there? And if so, how, how can we readjust it there? in other countries that did not share the same, the yeah. same history? Well, all I can say is, um, uh, last week I was speaking in, I was invited to Kuwait, and then I spoke in Turkey, um, and, um, and both, of, both of those audiences thought that the future of capital, they, they'd read the stuff, right? And they thought this is really applied. Um, my most fascinating visit was a very senior official from the government of Singapore, who said, this is now our problem. I was astonished. I thought the future of capitalism was basically saying Singapore has done a pr pretty good job. And he said, yeah, we did in the past, but now, we're, yeah. Um, uh, um, Thursday morning I got breakfast with um, a uh, very senior political figure from Malaysia. So apparently this seems to resonate. Or well, I'm just invited to Latin America in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so uh, this seems to be resonating because... Um, this general structure of trying to get to build a sense of shared identity around a, use it for a common forward-looking purpose that will make the future you know, a better future for your children than, than the present generation has had. That seems to resonate everywhere and the idea of reciprocal obligations turns out to be hardwired in our brains. So let me close with two little tips, right? So one is that um, if I start to feel 
generous dispositions to you, I want to help you, I release a chemical called oxytocin. And that release of oxytocin is reflective. So when your brain picks up this chemical oxytocin, you, you release oxytocin. That makes you feel that you should generously dispose towards me. And so these reciprocal obligations are chemically hardwired into us. They're natural things to do. Now we need to focus them around some purpose, and that's where the politics comes in. So, um, you know, that, that's, that seems to me rather... Uh, Universal. Yeah, 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 I think so. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Collier.